<clears throat> Welcome back, AP. All right, we're actually going to get this flip up in time, and we're going to start moving so we can get into some really important stuff tomorrow when we begin to talk about the unification of Italy and the unification of Prussia turning into Germany, which is one of my more favorite stories to talk about. We're going to probably fly through Italy just because I don't think it's that cool. But, uh, like, we're going to talk about Germany, though. We're going to talk about, like, Prussia becoming Deutschland, yeah? All right, so now, look, real quick, where we left off, speaking of Germans and whatnot, uh, we discussed the Second Industrial Revolution in class, right? We started talking about the burst of industrial creativity following the scientific development of people like Mendeleev and Faraday and Bessemer and several other major figures that the ideas of blending their new scientific thought with Newton's laws of thermodynamics is going to create a burst forward in industrial uh, kind of like simplicity and making things more mechanical, more sound, more smart, right? Smaller interchangeable parts, the processing of rubber under John Dunlop, uh, creation of fertilizer, petroleum distillation. We have gas-powered things now, right? Processing maritime technology, including iron steamboats, right? We're now starting to travel by steam further. The Titanic is a great example of one of those later very large iron steam vessels, right? That's 1912, though. So, like, now we're right now kind of in that brink of time going from 18 to 19, okay? Maritime technology is very important, but the Bessemer process is very important. Bessemer being a German-speaking scientist who's going to advocate for the production of steel, right? So now we're getting into some more things, but we're going to shift a little bit, and we're going to social sciences and evolution, right? Now, the big thing you need to understand is that we're talking about science, industry, how all those things were blended together. And we're discussing overall in Europe from 1850 to about 1914, how those sciences are changing everything around people's lives. We haven't gotten to the politics yet of 1815 to 1914, but we're getting to those very, very soon, okay? So take the objective ideas of science and let's apply them to society. How did we get here? Why are those people poor? Why is that guy rich? How does all this work, right? So you're now starting to see the birth of a new social science, right? The idea of sociology, right? Sociology is going to begin to really grow out of the 1850s, right? Um, and it's going to be begin to grow because people begin to actually take data much more accurately, right? We now have statistics on crime, children, rates of death, rates of child death, rates of poverty, right? We're starting to get to the point in the 1850s where people can go out and record actual sociological statistics in a much more efficient way, right? Now, Marx is a great example of one of these social scientists, right? He publishes the Communist Manifesto in 1848. He uh, does It doesn't get tremendously popular until the 1880s, which we will talk about later, but Marx can now actually be pointed to as a guy that was on the heels or the early, early part of the social science explosion because he can view and witness, observe, and collect data on the rates of poverty, the proletariat, the urban working class, their experiences, and begin to quantify those things to actually be able to have hardcore numbers saying, this percent of people are below the poverty line. This percent of people are above a poverty line. This percent of people are going to be destroyed by that percent of people, right? That's a very, very good example to use is Marx being an early social scientist, right? Now, we're getting into something a little bit more difficult, a little bit more important, and we're talking about Darwin and evolution, right? So the big things about Darwin and evolution, and I'm going to jump right over here to my board so we can talk about him a little bit further because I don't like putting tons and tons and tons of information on the screen itself when I talk about Darwin and evolution because it's very important to be able to understand him on a very concrete level, right? So for example, we're going to have to erase some things. I'm sorry, Angelina, but I got to get rid of your guy, Stein, right? And I'm also going to get rid of the, uh, uh, what you call it? Oh, actually, no. We're going to keep Bella's really ugly bird, right? So Bella Carbo drew this really, really disgustingly ugly bird on my uh, board the other day. And we can use him to discuss how we're going to analyze the science of evolution, right? So in Charles Dar... That doesn't do anything. Um, yeah. That didn't do anything either. Um, all right. So here we go. Ev Brown. Uh, so black. This is black, 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 black. Because you can see that a little bit easier, right? Here we go. So also, shout out T. James. Um, so now look. So we have the science of evolution, right? Now, in evolutionary science, we're going to see this being birthed in the late 1800s, right? And the sciences of evolution are going to be outlined by Charles Darwin in his book known as 
the origin of species, right? So the origin of species, okay? And he figures out the ideas of evolution proposed on one fundamental law in the origin of species. Really quick, let's look up the date that the origin of species was published. I believe it's 18. Uh, what do I got? What do I got? Oh, wait, that's just origin of of species, the origin of species. Not Alexander, what the heck is that? Um, yeah, on the origin of species was published by Charles Darwin in 1859, right? It's gonna be published in 1859 after his journeys to the Galapagos Islands on a boat called the HMS Beagle, right? So, and the origin of species outlines a very, very key important concept. It's known as the law of natural selection, okay? And the law of natural selection predicates its ideas on the strongest survive, right? Now, just to give you a heads up, the ideas of evolution that we're outlining right here had kind of existed for a little while before, right? There was a scientist that came before Darwin named Lamarck, right? So Lamarck, though, on the other hand, is going to have some problems in some less quantifiable data, okay? So actually, it's spelled ill M A R C. Okay, all right, so Lamarck came before Darwin, actually preceded him, okay? And he actually theorized the idea that current day organisms came from less complicated organisms and that basically species like, kind of progressed over time and became more intense and more, uh, more sophisticated, right? Well, the problem with this, though, is everyone began to ask Lamarck, well, why? Why did they become more intense? Why did they become more in, in, like, in, intense and... Uh, more complicated. Why did these organisms like evolve in this way? Blah, 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 blah. It wasn't until Darwin came along where he had a theory or an idea known as natural. All right, AP, sorry about that. But apparently, again, I was talking to myself for about like 15 minutes. So we're going to pick up right where my video cut out. Okay. And we were talking about evolution, right? If you want to jump back again really quick, just re rehash everything. When we were talking about evolu ev evolution, evolution, we had Lamarck, right? Who is a French scientist and then Darwin, who is an English scientist, and they are going to be the first people to come up with the thoughts on evolution, right? As you know, Lamarck didn't have any kind of data to use, right? He didn't have any kind of quantifiable evidence to support his idea that some organisms start out simple and then get much more complex as time goes on, right? Whereas Darwin proposes the idea of natural selection, right? And I have an illustration to help explain natural selection and how the ideas of it will be later on twisted and contorted to actually serve political sketchy purposes, right? So the big example I have is right here. And we have two artistic renderings of birds, right? This bird is by Bella Carbo, okay? This one is Bella's bird. And this is Laney's bird, right? That's Lane Stupridge's bird, okay? So we're gonna pretend for a second that this is natural selection, right? We're gonna pretend for a hot second that apparently this bird came into being as far as scientists know around 2000 BC, right? There's this very simple bird, the Bella bird, right? So the Bella bird is like just kind of kind of funky looking. He's got this weird back wing over here. He eats worms apparently. He's got little short stubby legs and looks like he has a giant chin. Now, the big thing about, though, this bird is going to go through a chance variation, right? So Darwin didn't know what to call them at the time because he didn't write his book until 1859, right? And in 1859, no one knew what these things actually were. But what it actually is, is a mutation, right? So somewhere along the line, one of these birds had a mutated spawn, right? And that spawn had a certain characteristic, okay? And that characteristic of the new bird, the Laney bird, okay, this, this mutated version of that bird has longer legs and better wings and a more structurally sound tail and actually can easily fly and perch on branches, right? So what's going to happen is eventually this bird will die out due to the fact that it is weaker than this stronger bird, right? That is how natural selection works. The idea that this strongest version of the bird survives, right? And that this one is going to die out. Another good example that science teachers oftentimes like to use is the difference between giraffes. At one point, giraffes had short necks. Short neck giraffes couldn't get to the leaves on the top of the trees. So long neck giraffes are going to be the mutants that actually end up living long. Look at that sweet giraffe. That is a terrible giraffe. This giraffe ain't even got no body. A little short stubby leg giraffe. Now, so there you go, right? So basically what's going to end up happening is the long neck mutant giraffe is going to be the one that ends up succeeding because he is a stronger variant of this animal, right? The strongest will survive and these natural mutations will continue to progress us forward, right? So that's how natural selection works, right? And Darwin's theories are going to be compounded 
and then exampled and then enhanced over time, right? And so Darwin's ideas on natural selection get really, really held on to, right? Get really, really, oh God, it was a gross burp. Propagated very, very quickly and really, really advanced, right? And they become an avid part of the political sphere. Now, there are some people who love Darwin's theories. There are other people who absolutely hated Darwin's theories, right? Most, like some religious organizations would reject Darwin's theories, while some scientific organizations fully accepted them, right? Some people use them as political cartoons, saying that they refuse to uh, like believe that we are descendant of apes, and some others are going to use them as ideas to be like, well, this explains where human beings come from and the advancement of our societies, right? So you're going to see some people absolutely hate Darwin's ideas, and some people are really going to approve of them, right? So just go ahead and jot that down real quick. Be like, this is a controversial topic because uh, socially speaking, some organizations accepted it while others rejected it, right? And we'll expand on that in class a little bit more. Now, the worst thing that happened is when this was politically and socially going to be changed dramatically, right? And so politically, socially speaking, Darwin's ideas would then be taken and warped and morphed into this idea called social Darwinism, right? Now, social Darwinism is when people try to take Darwin's, Darwinism, is when they try to take Darwin's theories and they actually try to like use that to show that certain races were stronger or certain religions were stronger or that certain people deserve to be subjugated by other people. And as we know, that is racist, all right? That is racist, it is wrong, it is in fact not correct whatsoever. However, Europeans are gonna to gravitate towards this idea in the late 1800s to give them justification for this imperialism, right? And this is an important thing to bring up later on, but I did wanna go ahead and bring it up now, but they're gonna try and use social Darwinism to justify their imperialistic tendencies, right? This idea that Europeans had the right and the necessary need to go and take over other groups of people, leading to lots of death and lots of violence. And we will talk about the Belgian conquest of the Congo when we talk about imperialism, and we'll be able to show you how social Darwinism is a terrible thing that was used to justify the subjugation of other groups. Groups, right? So Darwin's ideas were great for the scientific community. Some people will reject them, right? We talked about the method. Some people are going to accept them. And also when they got politically or socially skewed into social Darwinism, it was all bad, right? So that's a big thing that we will talk about low, a little bit more in class. We'll expand on those ideas, right? So anyway, let's keep jumping into it though. So we talked about Darwin and evolution. Now we're going to jump over and we're going to make sure I'm still recording. And we're also going to talk about August Comte, right? So August Comte is another revolutionary thinker from this time period, right? So August Comte is gonna be the father of sociology, okay? So as the father of sociology, he uses this thing called the positivist method, okay? The positivist method is the idea or the socialized structure of trying to figure out how does a society know anything for sure. And down in the description below, I'm going to go ahead and throw in a nice Tom Ritchie video. This Tom Ritchie video is actually really, really good. Um, and it's actually really, really funny. I got to give him props on that one. And he has a different way of explaining positivism than I do. But what it is, it doesn't mean positive like I'm such a positive person. As we know that Mr. Terry is a pretty positive person, right? He's pretty energetic all the time. He's usually in a really, really good mood to be in school. Not positive like that. I mean positive as in Mr. Terry is absolutely positive that the Black Death Plague is one of the most monumental events in European history, right? As in, he knows it beyond a shadow of a doubt positive, okay? So in the positivist method, uh, August Comte is going to uh, like basically expand on this idea that the only valid, truly, surely attained information comes through science and observation. As in, I'm positive, I know that I'm right, okay? So what he's getting at, though, is that society has gone through stages, right? What August Comte, like societally speaking, he's also a socialist, too, if you want to know his political organizations, but as a socialist, he believes that that is the next phase of human existence, right, as a social, like, socialist existence. But we'll talk that about that later. We'll bring up his ideas on socialism a little bit more when we get into Marxian, the or Marxian politics and things like that. But he postulates the idea that society has learned learned on a certain scale that whenever somebody like a society is trying to learn something first they go through what's known as the theological basis and the theological basis is when religion kind of outlines what a society understands right then he says the metaphysical phase is the abstract 
unprovable idea, right? Like as in, we're pretty sure, but we can't prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And then there's the scientific phase, right? Which is the understandable and positive. So we'll use an example that we talked about in class. We'll use the example of the organization of the universe, right? So according to August Comte, and he is absolutely 100% right on this, the very first people to expand on the ideas of the setup of the universe, heliocentric versus geocentric, are going to be your ancient Greek philosophers, your natural philosophers. And then those ideas are going to be gravitated to by the, um, by the religious institutions like the Catholic Church, right, in the Middle Ages. And so the Aristotle and Ptolemaic view of the universe gets propagated, and eventually the Catholic Church gravitates towards these ideas because they believe that they cannot observe the movement of the earth, so the earth must be stationary, and they also seek approval for this from their Bible and their religious text, right? And then we get into the metaphysical phase when Copernicus begins to theorize these different ideas on actually we're a heliocentric universe, and the only reason you can't like observe it is due to the fact that we are so small on the surface of the earth and that we are actually moving very, very quickly. And then the scientific phase is when Brahe, Kepler, uh, Newton and Galileo all begin to use math positive pr approval and scientific based proofs to show that we do in fact go around the sun not the other way around right so that is a really really important way that I can explain that but he's also he's a hundred percent right right this is usually how most methods of learning things go through a societal perspective right uh, so that's the August Comte uh, th th theories of uh, learning on a societal scale right so we just spent a lot of time talking about a lot of different stuff right we talked about uh, society and cities and social structure from 1850 to 1914. And then we talked about scientific thought and the increased movement of industrialization from 1850 to 1914. We just finished that up, right? We talked about Darwin and Comte and the Second Industrial Revolution, Newton's Laws of Thermodynamics, Faraday, Mendeleev. We talked about all those guys. Freud, right? And how Freud is going to be a direct reaction to the societal aspect, right? We got more dense family units, so he's going to analyze psychosis based on these different ideas. Now, we talked about that, and we went all the way from 1850 to 1914 with that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to begin to talk about the political sphere from 1850 to 1914, right? So if you want to do me a favor, just put politics from 1850 to 1914. And the first two things we're going to start off with when we talk about politics from 1815 to 1850 to 1914 is we're going to discuss nationalism and imperialism, right? Now, nationalism is going to be discussed in a lot of different ways. We're going to talk about nationalism through the lens of socialism. We're going to talk about nationalism through the lens of anti-Semitism. We're going to talk about the nationalism through the lens of liberalism. And we're also going to talk about through the veins of conservatism, right? We're going to talk about nationalism in a lot of different ideas. We're going to talk about it as in our personal genius is going to unify countries. We're going to get two brand new countries out of the nationalist movement of the late 1800s. That, of course, being Italy and Deutschland, right? Yes, Deutschland. Now, the big thing, though, is nationalism and imperialism are two very important concepts. We're going to start off with nationalism, okay? So nationalism is a very intense thing, but what nationalism is, and we discussed this in our last unit, is the idea that every single society has a genius, right? It's the idea that a society or a cultural group has a genius all their own, okay? They have a common language. They have a common social structure. They have common dishes, diets, songs, music, flags, and national imagery, right? That is their genius, and they are all bonded together by these images of their nation, state, and their cultural groups, right? So it can appeal to a lot of different people. Nationalism truly appeals to both liberals and conservatives alike. Conservatives like to use the idea of nationalism to promote their people over on top of others. Empires really love to use nationalism, being like, well, the Austrians are here to save you from yourselves. And that's disgusting. Now, um, the liberals also love the idea of nationalism because it can create bonds between separate companies and lead to free trade markets and things like that. So it's very advantageous to both of those groups. So the nationalism kind of bonds liberalism and conservatism together. Now, the interesting part about it is it does kind of extradite socialism a little bit because it's giving more further ownership to other people and it's kind of bringing about those ideas and those big debates on property, right? Now, very, very radical nationalism can be because you're possibly seeing groups break away from empires and it can also be very liberating when we see common groups of people uniting in the face of empires, right? So nationalism is a very unique thing. In the first place, we're going to start off by talking about nationalism is France, right? Because why are we starting here? Why are we not jumping straight into Italy and Germany? We're starting with France so we can discuss the national tendencies of France following the 1848 revolution. And also, as we know, in continental Europe, 
France from 1793 up until 1848 is just causing a lot of kerfuffles in like the rest of Europe. So we do need to start there, right? So when we're discussing France, you have to understand when we last left off, we were talking about our guy, Louis Napoleon. That's right, Louis Napoleon and Napoleon III, same man. So if you hear me say Louis Napoleon, or if you see hear me say Napoleon III, you need to take solace in the fact that they're the same guy, all right? So that's right, Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III, same dude. And also, just so you're reminded, Napoleon II is already dead, right? That is the son of Napoleon I, or Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon II dies in Austria at the age of 21 from tuberculosis. Actually, I have seen the room, apparently, that he died in inside the Schoenbrunn Palace in Vienna. It's very, very cool. There's a memoriam there. It's very, very neat. But the big thing you have to understand also is that we are now getting to a very intense form of French politics, right? And we have to understand the progression of French politics up until this point, right? We cannot discuss Louis Napoleon or Napoleon III's ideas in the grand scheme of French politics until we make sure we know exactly where we came from, okay? So our first place, and I think I'm gonna go on like a like a diagonal line like this, right? We're gonna go over the advancement of French politics so we can get like little lines going, okay? So this is our earliest and we're going to latest right here, okay? So this is starting out in the Middle Ages and this is going all the way to 1848, okay? So, or actually it's going all the way to 1851. All right, so now, the big thing about this though, you do not have to draw it this way, you can just list them, okay? But in the Middle Ages, all the way up until 1793, we have what was known as the French monarchy, right? So, we had the French monarchy from the Middle Ages all the way up until 1793. Now, as we know, in 1793, Louis XVI is going to yank loose his noggin, right? And we're going to then be entering into a republic phase under the reign of terror, right? And that's going to be the French First Republic, okay? So I'm just going to put rep, okay, just so you know. It's the French First Republic, okay? And that's going to happen as of 1793, okay? And that's going to go all the way up until 18. Four, when Napoleon declares himself emperor of France and takes it to the French First Empire. I'm going to put EMP so I don't take up too much of your time, okay? But the French First Empire, and that's going to be 1804, and it's going to go up until about 1812 when he is first exiled, and then we got into our, uh, we got into our restoration phase, right? So then we got into French monarchy. I'm going to put mon for monarchy, French monarchy. Restoration. That's when our Louis the 18th came back, and when we got Charles the 10th, and then those guys are going to advocate our 20-minute king, right? Louis the 19th was in there, and the French Restoration period also ends up ending with Louis, Duke of Orléans, right? And then he ends up abdicating. Now, as of 1848, and this goes from 1812 to 1848, and then the other big thing about it is that now as of 1848, we now have our French Second Republic. Okay, so we're now currently, when we're in 1848, in the French Second Republic. And in the French Second Republic, we have our first president, right? We have our first French president, and that first French president is going to be none other than Napoleon III himself. And I know you all are impressed that I know the phases of the French government as of the Middle Ages all the way up until 1848. Why I know these things, I have no idea, but I just guess I need to stop reading so much. Now, the big thing about it, though, is why him? Why Napoleon III? Why is this dude the scoundrel that some people would refer to him as because he actually tried to take over the French government in 1831 as well when he tried to throw a coup against the government, but it failed miserably. You don't need to know that, but he spent a lot of time exiled in London, which actually is going to be a safe haven for a lot of political extradition or extraditable offenders, like Metternich, for example, is going to end up in London as well. But we're going to discuss two guiding questions about the French Second Republic, right? The French Second Republic is being guided by two things. Why did they choose Napoleon III and Whose side is he on and what is his platform, right? So let's go ahead and dive straight into that. Well, why Napoleon III? Napoleon III is going to be chosen from 1848 to 1870. That's right. Napoleon III is going to rule over France from 1848 to 1870. And when he comes in in 1848, he is given only a four-year term as president. Jot that down, right? His electable understanding is that he is going in to be president with only four years to rule. Some of y'all are immediately looking at this thing, and I know Gia Hardigen right now, and Rebecca Boulanger, and Cassie Swallow is like, wait a minute, Mr. Terry. 1848 to 1870 is 22 years. That is not four years. You're full of it, right? Well, some crazy stuff's gonna happen, okay? We're gonna get there in a second. But he comes in and he believes that as the executive, he has to rule with this thing called the National Constituent Assembly, okay? And that is their Congress, all right? So Napoleon III is elected, why, okay? And he has to rule a song alongside of this National Constituent Assembly, 
why. We need to know these things, right? We need to know why is Napoleon III being chosen, and we also need to know what effects is he going to have on their said government, okay? Why is Napoleon III going to be elected to the French Second Republic? He's not only just going to be elected, he gets elected in a landslide, right? He gets elected in a landslide, one, because of who his uncle is, right? Nobody would give uh, donkeys behind in carnival care about Napoleon III if he was not related, in fact, to Napoleon Bonaparte himself. There was always a big conspiracy that a lot of people say he actually came from a different father and stuff like that, and that he was just being an opportunist. He was claiming the name of Napoleon because it would help him later on with politics. Man, I just said that really fast. Um, but we don't really know that for sure, right? We don't really know for sure because they didn't have DNA testing in 1848. But anyway, his uncle and his uncle's reputation of bringing France to the most powerful they had ever been during this time period right here with the French First Empire, a lot of people believed that that is going to be the guy that leads us now to the promised land again. Let's elect Napoleon III who will bring us back to power, okay? So that's why he got a lot of, like, credo and a lot of electability was from his uncle. Second reason why is because conservatives and liberals alike, especially in France, as we remember from the June days, I don't know if you remember the June days, but when the middle class army opened fire on a bunch of socialists in the streets, and that was from our type, our actual photograph that we looked at, of course, with the barriers across the street, that was our last phase of the 1848 revolution in France, um, they have a very big fear of socialism. The liberals and the conservatives are uniting under the same bannerment that they are afraid of the growing Marxian ideas of socialism, all right? So well, remember, socialists, French utopian socialists and Marxists are two different things, um, and all, not all socialists are Marxists. That is very important that we understand. We will discuss that more when we get to it because we're actually going to read the Communist Manifesto and go over that stuff. Malai, I know you're excited. Now, popular programs, though, are also going to be distributed in a pamphlet, right? So he's a good at advertising. He's capitalizing on the fear of uh, socialism, and he also has a good rep because of his uncle. If you look at this map right here, you can actually see exactly what I'm talking about. Those counties that are in green voted in mass for Napoleon III. Okay? If the county is in green or dark green or black, that means a large percentage of them voted for Napoleon III. That's right. He won with 74% of the vote and a very large vote at that. Okay, So when he comes in, also, he was very good at advertising. He had posters that were circulated all over France. He also had a pamphlet that was circulated all over France. And there would be very popular imagery showing his relation to Bonaparte, showing two children fighting in the street over the presidential election and the face of Napoleon's supporter facing us, right? So we had good advertising. We had the support of the military right here in this advertising. But also, speaking of that pamphlet, this is an essay that he released in the French newspapers of the era before the 1848 revolution. And it actually says, Extension du Paparizon which is the extinction of pauperism, okay? So this essay actually got him, like, advanced pretty quickly in the 1848 election because he's basically advocating for the fact that he is going to put an end and make the extinction of poor poverty economics in France. And he has a lot of ideas that are circulated in this, and he believes that it is the government job, the government's job, to help its people. Right? So a lot of people are believing in Napoleon right now, and there are very high hopes for him because they think he's a very strong moderate, big moderate, moderate candidate because he's showing elements of conservatism, he's showing elements of liberalism, and he's showing elements of socialism as well by agreeing to help the poor. Right? Now, a lot of people are like, well, he's not a socialist. And they're like, yeah, well, we're not going to get a socialist elected no matter what, so might as well pick the guy that's going to advocate for us at the very least. So someone who's going to advocate for all people. Very, very high hopes for a Napoleon III. Right? And when he comes into power... The National Constituent Assembly is loaded down with conservatives, right? And a lot of this is due to the fact that we talked about during these elections where we're electing constituent assemblies and we're electing congresses and we're making constitutions. A lot of poor people elected names that they knew, which actually were conservatives. They didn't realize that the socialists didn't have the ability to advertise as well as the conservatives. So they have a very dense conservative legislative branch. So to get anything done to help the people that he promised to help when he actually is running for president of France, he has to placate that conservative legislative branch to get them to agree to do the things that he wanted, right? There are two things that he wants them to get done, and we'll get to that here in a second. But he has to figure out a way to make the conservatives in that legislative branch happy so those reforms can be passed, right? And what he's going to do to placate those that conservative legislative branch is he's going to increase the role of the Catholic Church in education, opening more elementary and secondary education schools to be used by the upper class and as well as the wealthy middle class so they can start sending their children to school, right? He also is going to strip 
stripped some voting rights away from some poor people, which apparently he did not want to do, but he has to keep this conservative legislative branch happy so he can pass these reforms, right? And that's why he did these things. He stripped some voting rights away and increased the Catholic Church role in education due to the fact that he wants to keep good on his promises and actually use the approval of these conservatives to escalate his reforms through. And second reason, the selfish reason, is he wanted to run for a second term. But the way the new constitution in France was written as of 1848 with the French Second Republic, right, because we're right here in the French Second Republic, is that the presidents will only serve for four years, right? That they will only serve for four years and then we will hold another general election, right? Well, the problem is, is Napoleon's like, well, I want to serve for another term, fellas. I want to serve for another term. I want to be able to kind of be here for a little while and get these things done. And here's the problem. The conservatives inside the National Constituent Assembly did not want to give him this. They refused to rewrite the Constitution, and they refused to give him a second term, even though they tried to placate them and keep them happy. So what does a Napoleon do when the people do not want to listen to him? That's right, Molly Man Japan, you're absolutely correct. A coup d'etat, right? So he organizes a coup d'etat as of 1852, and he leads the military against its own government, right? He did have some opposition, just a heads up. Some middle class rebels and protests did break out um, due to the fact that some of them were vying to become a part of that National Constituent Assembly. They were working their way towards being elected inside of it, and they resisted Napoleon III early on because they believed that he was going to prevent them from actually accomplishing those political goals. Now, what is Napoleon going to do to suppress these things? He's just going to have a massive military, and he's going to suppress them very quickly with force. But what he does, the first thing he comes into power after he throws this coup, is he does just like his uncle did, right? Let's make it so the people of France agree that they want what I'm giving them, right? So he regrants universal suffrage. And he tells the people of France, I will end pauperism, and I will do all the things that I did now, but I need you to vote for me to make sure that I'm president for longer, right? So he has the Constitution rewritten on his own, and 92% of people in a universal suffrage plebiscite vote to elect him president for 10 years and less than a year later as of 1852 late 1852 because this is actually supposed to say 1851 that's supposed to say 1851 a little typo sorry about that as of one year later 97 percent of him of 97 percent of the, all the voting people in france elect him emperor for life right that's right this right here is napoleon iii himself taking a photograph an actual ten type photograph after the coup d'etat of 1851, right? So that is him actually trying to display himself. And just so you know, quick heads up, now we have entered into yet another phase of the French government, right? So now we're in French Second Republic. Now we're going to be the French Second Empire because we are being led by a hereditary emperor. And that's going to last from 1852 to 1870. All right, so now look, really quick, so now we're entering into yet another phase of the French government where we're calling it the French Second Empire, okay? And so we are being led by this emperor by the name of Napoleon III, and we will talk about him a little bit more later on. But in the Second Empire things, we have to understand that there are some mixed successes and there are some mixed failures, okay? So we do need to talk about his biggest successes and we need to talk about his biggest failures, all right? His biggest successes, of course, have to be around the economy and his failures all start around 1860, all right? But the big successes he has as in the economy as Napoleon III, and the reason why so many people were eager and to keep him as emperor for such a long period of time is the fact that he is going to come in and stimulate the economy by force using government intervention, right? He does this by having railroads built that made industrial industrialism on the continent possible. He pushes corporate banks to offer loans to industrial companies at limited liability rates, which means that the company that invests in these loans will only ever lose the amount that they invested in them, right? That is limited liability, as in they only stand to lose the money that they invest. But due to the fact that the industrialism was becoming the biggest bee's knees that the continent had ever seen, everyone was going to make their money and it was going to be okay. So this is kind of a win-win for him. He's also going to hire Baron de Haussmann to renovate and reconstruct Paris with grand boulevards, ringed boulevards, knock those walls down and make amazing roadways out of them and even put some sewer pipes in and actually make it so we can keep our people healthier, right? And the great thing about Hausman's reforms is it employed a ridiculous amount of workers, right? They needed people to build things, make roads, build parks, do all this stuff, so the government is helping directly pay them, right? You also are going to see unemployment decline under him due to things like Hausman and due to the building of the railroads, and they're going to rise, and also wages are going to rise with inflation. 
This is good economic times going on in France right now, okay? Also, how do you keep the urban workers happy? Stroke of genius by your boy Napoleon III. I don't really know how I feel about this guy because he's kind of awful and he's kind of great all at the same time because he allows, that's right, public workers, he lets them, or pu excuse me, public urban workers, he allows them to form unions. Keep them happy. Let them form their unions. Let them go on strike so wages will continue to increase along with inflation, okay? And that is where we're going to stop right there because I don't want to take up too much of your time. But I will see you guys tomorrow. Y'all have a great one.